In today's episode of Bidget TV, I've got a special guest from Boca Raton in Florida, uh, Jeff Kersey, who's going to be joining us. He's a pilot and also entrepreneur, and he'll tell us the story of how he started, you know, contracting as a private jet pilot and how that's led him to a number of business ventures. And also, um, he's also owner of his own airplanes. He lives in an air park with his family. He has a villa and a hangar next door. And so it's interesting to hear Jeff's journey into private aviation and how he started, how he gets on with things, how he launched Private Jet Pilots Network, which is an interesting network of contractors that are always looking for work um, out there. As you know, most of the private jet pilots out there, a good 30 to 40 percent of the private jets around the world are actually contractors. So um, Jeff kind of tells the story of how this came about. So it's very interesting. It's a 50 minute interview. Um, so, you know, sit down, relax, um, enjoy um, my chat with Jeff. He's a great guy and um, offers some really, really interesting insights. So let's get into the interview with Jeff. Off we go. Uh, Jeff, welcome to BizJet TV. Thanks, man. That's pretty cool. Thanks so, Jeff, tell us how you got involved in flying. When did you start flying? And uh, and and tell us about your, your story as an entrepreneur. Man, so it's kind of like one of those fueled childhoods yeah. when I was when I was uh, four years old. So I was a Navy brat. So maybe it's just let's start from there. Yeah, I was okay. born in Jacksonville as a Navy brat. My dad was a mechanic on the Kennedy and yeah. he wanted to re-enlist and go be, you know, go to officer school and start flying like F-18s or whatever's on the carrier at that time. And my mom said, no, don't do that. Um you know, just retire from there and come go get your pilot's license as a civilian. Yeah. So he had a, a business and he, I guess, moved us up to New Jersey. You know, this is stuff I, this is just stories that I had as a kid. Yeah. And he started flight training and he took me on his first flight. So I was around four years old. They put me in the back of a 172. Uh -huh. and I saw my dad's in the left seat. So I associated the left seat as with, as the driver, but I noticed there's a guy in the right seat who's manipulating the controls. So it bugged me out because I only trusted my dad. <laughs> So the instructor turns around like this, picks me up out of the back seat, and puts me on my dad's lap. Yeah. And I sat there while they did the flight, looking out the window. And that's when I got the bug. I just loved flying. I thought it was the coolest thing. And I got into building remote control airplanes. As you see, there's a helicopter hanging up on my air conditioner. <laughs> air here. I just started tinkering. You look on my kitchen table. If I took you yeah. in there. There's an F-14 Tomcat kit that my son's building. It starts starts like that. Yeah, you know, he's, yeah, he's got way cooler stuff now with video games and virtual reality. The games that they got in this thing is insane yeah. for flying. <laughs> so I just kept kept feeling it, and like everything around me was feeling that as well. My neighbor right across the street, where I was growing up, used to put this clear cellophane over his garage, so he had lighting. Yeah, and he put there building remote control airplanes. So after school, I would run over there, and he'd be there working on an airplane. I'd be sanding down. We built this huge p51 mustang it took us all winter long yeah. and then when the spring finally broke we'd take it out to lakers naval air base and go fly it yeah so it's just yeah. you know it's, it's enjoying the process of building an airplane with the hope of you get to go fly this thing yeah. taught you taught me that there's a lot of bs behind aviation and then you get this result of getting to go fly yeah. so um my dad kept working his business didn't end up being like a professional pilot or anything yeah he bought a couple of airplanes and was starting to lease them out to flight schools. Yeah. I was learning the headaches of that kind of ownership of like, man, these things are always needed maintenance. They're always getting broken. Yeah. And I'd be one of the students out there flying them and burning them up. Yeah. And then, I don't know, I sold it at 16. Took a little bit of a deviation when my mom passed away when I was 17. But as fate would have it, this is where, you know, kind of like where God just came into my life and basically put, pulled me up. And that's where I got the nickname Phoenix because like I thought it crashed and burned everything. And then. Uh -huh. He pulled me up out of the fiery ashes. Yeah. And it went from there. Um, so what did you use? Did you join the military or did you just? No, I, started, I wanted to go in the military, but she had put an axe to that early on. Mom mom was like, I don't want you to go in the military. So I just kind of left that path. I moved to Florida. And when I got down to Florida, I started my own business doing window tinting. And then I was tinting and flying and tinting and flying. And then, you know, started selling charter. My dad was getting into the charter business. Um, I got lucky with selling this guy's airplane around the charter. And he took a liking to me, came into the office, yeah. banged on the desk and said, how'd you like to come? How'd you like to leave the mahogany bomber and come fly a Learjet with me? Yeah. I was looking up at this guy. Like, what? <laughs> and he's like, it's more than flying. He's like, I'm buying a Lear 55. 
Yeah. So you'll be the co-pilot. I was like, are you serious? And everything kind of kept unraveling and 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 working in my favor. I had one of my friends uh, found out that I was going to do that, and he's like, "Hey, we're getting a G550. Why don't you come with me to Savannah?" And mm-hmm. back in the day, this is the G550 hadn't even been released yet, so it was like a seven or eight day transition course. Yeah. So I got to sit in flight safety and see how everything went down. Yeah. Saw how he did everything as a professional, and then I went out to school for my initial. Yeah. And then I, I learned at that point that it was all about relationships yeah. because the relationship that you made the friendship that you made give you a, a result and people you know when you have this camaraderie and the fellowship in aviation which you know it's like flying formation and when you fly formation with somebody it's like you have this you know dude we did this together today you mm-hmm. know we enjoyed this together today you have a bond with that person yeah so aviation aviation gives people a really beautiful bond and the friendship because you trust them too right you have to like i trust you for flying you're gonna hold your head and you're gonna hold your altitude and we experienced this together today and i saw that that's what that's what this has to offer that's the beauty in aviation is people are doing cool things people are working hard and being diligent to build airplanes so working hard to manage them working hard to obtain them and then we're working hard to maintain proficiency professional in the space and there's a you know there's a level there's there's a level in everything of becoming the the peak like you always want to find like how do i get to my peak performance because it's so it's so easy to succumb to you know averages mm-hmm. because you're gonna be like you know what that's good enough that's a checkbox there i've gone as far as i'm comfortable with versus i th- i think aviation offers to people who like to be challenged they give it gives you that corner you know, like if you want to operate there, you can check that out. You know, you got your performance manual, you got your conditions, you got your aircraft, you got your personal limitations. So you learn a lot about yourself. You learn a lot about your circle. I mean, that's kind of like my tight in a nutshell. You want me to go on to entrepreneurial stuff from here? Well, yeah. So I know you, you got into the car business at some point. So you were flying as a, as a private jet pilot, basically, and selling some charters. And then how, how did you get involved in the, in the car? Is that something that just happened as you were moving along? Yeah, things were starting to present themselves. And I think the major presentation was contract flying. Mm-hmm. Kind of really, it really opened up my eyes because you can get a job making a salary mm-hmm. and you have this little safety cushion of believing that you're safe. Mm-hmm. But then all of a sudden the airplane sells or mm-hmm. the business that was behind it and backing it had some sort of problem. And now the airplane's the first thing to go because it's a great expense. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So after you experience that and, you know, you look at my resume and it's like, you know, one year here, two years here, or one year here, six months there. Yeah. And people say, I've had people say, well, well what did you do? Yeah. I'm like, well, it's not me. I can't control that The guy sold the airplane. <laughs> and yeah. let's say, let's say you're flying a citation three yeah. and you're happy as a clam flying for somebody and go, okay, I can finally, you know, wrestle in my feathers here. And this is my little home. And then the guy says, oh, hey, by the way, I sold the citation three. And now we're getting a uh, a G4 SP and we're getting two new pilots because they have to be experienced. Yeah. But, 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 you know, but, you know, thank you. That's what, that's what happens to a lot of guys in aviation. Well, that happened to me, but I hear it happens to other people too. Sometimes yeah. you get lucky and they're like, oh yeah, send them to school. We're going to do this and put up this stuff. Other times their insurance says, sorry, got to have 500 hours in type. Yeah. So those are the cha- those are the challenges as you're navigating your way as a professional pilot and as being a contract pilot. I get a lot of guys that call me up and say, "Dude, I'm going to go to G550 school." I'm like, well, why are you going to do that? Well, because it's cool, and mm-hmm. I want to fly that. Yeah. It's like, well, you're never going to get in the seat unless you really have a connection. And somebody's going to be willing to take a zero time person and put them over there. Yeah. And there's probably been I could say there's a couple thousand type ratings that have just gone to waste on the industry yeah. from people hoping to aspire into that and not get any option. It was hard for me to break into the into the 550, but luckily I got I got that. So entrepreneurial stuff came out from being in the right place at the right time, looking at the information and making the ahas of going, data's coming my way. Yeah. What do I do with this data? You know, yeah. who's this information for and what's he going to do with it? So I started to realize like, well, this piece of data comes over here and this person over here, if I give this data to that person, they're going to do really well. So in the beginning, I'd be like, hey, check this out. I got this for you. Mm-hmm. Or this came away. Oh, thanks, kid. And then they go and make a whole bunch of money. I'm like, Wait a second. I didn't get, you know, or they'd say, hey, I'm going to give you this for putting that together. And then the deal would go through. I'd be like, well, what about mine? What are you talking about? 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's a, that happens a lot. So you need to learn the entrepreneurial spirit is if you're good at something, you got to get paid for it. So mm-hmm. I would say, I've got a piece of data. So now I would, you know, hold a little data back and say, I've got this opportunity. Does this interest you? Oh yeah, it's pretty interesting. So then I would put the whole the entire deal together. But then I realized that, man, I really don't have enough power in this because I need to have money behind me. So that's where contract flying really helped me out because I would be contracting and hustling uh, saving up a whole bunch of money. Now I was able to be the, essentially the broker in a deal where if the, I saw that deal and go, wait a second, if I can buy this for 500,000 and sell it to you for a million, I make $500,000. Yeah. So you start putting those two and two together real quick. And then you get the surplus behind you, experience behind you. You have relationships and people that back you. Mm-hmm. That's what uh, became important. And then, I mean, the, the, obviously the most important ingredient in my life is God, because as much of a, mess up i am you know we all i mess up every single day you know my mouth my thoughts my actions my this Mm -hmm. you know living that for me living a repentant life and just saying hey i messed up again and you just feel that peace of like it's cool let's try again tomorrow he's Mm -hmm. always been like that to me pick it up let's try again tomorrow you know if you fall down get back up let's try again tomorrow do better tomorrow try to beat you yesterday today you know make yourself your own opponent and i also i talk to the future me you know, I'm 42 now. I talk to the 50 year old Jeff and say, what do you need me to do for you? Mm-hmm. Like, what do I do? And all I hear him say is like, quit messing up. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Walk right. Be strong. Just take your time, build your patterns. And it's, it's, I'm putting out a whole, I'm in the process of making it, but an actual pilot course mm-hmm. for guys who want to go the way of business pilot. Mm-hmm. And it's just taking me a little bit of time to unpack it. So if the outline's done, some of the videos are done. And mm-hmm. I want to release it. That's why I'm looking for a couple guys. Where I'd, if you saw on PJP, I'm looking for a couple guys to start coming underneath the wing and follow along. This way I can use them as success stories. Because it's amazing right. when you get when you get the right attitude and the right patterns and a little bit of time, you get the success. It's like a farmer, you know? You well, see I, this- I did this with a guy last year. He was um, flying for Emirates and he's flown airlines nearly all his life and he wanted to transit into private jets and he didn't know how. He had a bit of money um, because Emirates had laid a lot of people off. And um, so I coached him into what to do. And he went and got a Global Express rating. I told him about, you know, go here. And I know Dubai pretty well. So because I used to live out there. So, you know, he went to the right places, met the right people. And now he's um, he flew a Global 6000 for a while. Now he's got a new job on a Global 7500 and they paid for his rating. But I coached him over a couple of months. And uh, so, yeah, even even, you know, because there's lots of airline guys that want to go into private jet space, but not all the airline guys fit into the private jet space, as you probably know yourself. Um, So they need a bit. Well, first of all, you need to kind of assess have they got the right personality and they're not like turn up at the airplane expecting everything to happen, which is what happens with the airlines. I mean, when I was an airline captain, I just turn up, pick how much fuel I wanted. And then everybody ran around, did everything for me. And I just signed the paperwork. Um, if I, if I wasn't doing the, and one would put the stuff into the flight management system, the other one would do the walk around and then you jump in and go. Um, but you know, with the private jets, you, you got everything that you need to do <laughs> from A to Z. Yeah, There's no one. Be a servant. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, uh, so tell me about your car business that you, um, you got it. Cause I thought that was interesting as well. Which one torque auto storage. Yeah. Yeah. So unfortunately it's no longer in existence, but it was, it, uh, it sparked a lot of interest. And so not all businesses work. You know, yeah. I'm not afraid to fail. It costs yeah. me money and costs you money to fail, but you always get something out of it. You get that value back. So I started Torque Auto Storage with a guy because I was driving around the 911. Yeah. I was gone a whole bunch. And I'm thinking, well, I don't want my kids dropping the bicycle on it because I didn't have a huge garage at the time. Yeah. And, you know, it would be really cool if there was a place to go park these. Plus, maybe I'd meet some people out of it. So yeah. when I was at the dealership, I asked this guy, I said, hey, do you know what there's a, uh, like a, they had a parking garage and I was kind of sniffing for, you always got to be like turning things over, you know, you're like, yeah. what's under here. And yeah. you're always like, if you like that, you'd be surprised. Sometimes you'll find something. Yeah. So I was like, you know, there's a big parking garage here behind, behind Brayman is, you know, can I pay to store my car here? And I'm thinking it's right by the airport. The guy's like, nah, we don't offer that, but um, check out this place. And he was showing me a concept and I was like, Oh, this is really cool. Where is it? He goes, no, nah, it doesn't exist yet. Like, really? Well, let's, well, let's build it. So I partnered up with this guy mm-hmm. um, and as fate would have it, I found a building and the building, I negotiated a deal in the building. So, Hey, listen, I'm going to repurpose this building. It was a 10,000 square foot warehouse. They were storing protein powders and stuff in there. They were leaving to Orlando and they had um, 
I don't know, like two, two years and change left on the lease. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you could reassign it. So they wanted 10,000 a month. And I was like, mm, it's kind of expensive for a startup because I got to put a whole bunch of money into this thing. Mm -hmm. So I told the guy, I'm like, look, this is what I'm doing. And this is my network. This is the person I'm with. Do me a, if you believe in me and you've got nobody else to do this, give me the first six months for a thousand bucks a month. Give me the next six months for $4,000 a month. And then I'll give you an assessment at month 12 and mm -hmm. I'll show you my books. Yeah. And if I'm paying 10, if I'm making $10,000 a month, I'll give you the $10,000 a month. And he goes, okay, we'll take the deal. So mm -hmm. I didn't have to put any money down. I got to move into the place, got the keys. Uh, within the first six months, it was hard. But we started getting clients coming in. I, I don't know. I probably spent like 80000 to make the hangar and everything look really cool. Painted the whole place, cleaned the floors, bought lifts, put stickers up all over the walls, redid this whole interior. So you, you start to invest in this stuff and you build this thing out. Mm -hmm. And I parked my car in there. And then eventually some of you saw pictures and wanted to park their cars in there. And I started getting this really cool client list. Mm -hmm. At one point we had, I don't want to say like 110 cars stuffed in this place for like a hurricane. Because yeah. people look at the place to stick to her, their cars. And there's some guys that got some really cool collections in Palm Beach and Boca that were just like yeah. hidden gems. One yeah. guy called me up and said, you got room for 41 Porsche? Wow. 41? He goes, yeah, I have a collection. So he paid me like, I don't know, 20, <laughs> 20, grand, 20 grand to have his cars dropped off for a month. It yeah. was pretty cool. And had some really nice pictures out of it. Yeah. Well, you learn things in business. The, uh, the company that was that had the that owns the property saw that hey this is a nice looking business here mm -hmm. when it came time to renew this lease and to transfer over it went from ten thousand dollars a month to them wanting like thirty thousand dollars a month Ooh. i was like you know you're gonna gut us we're not there yet the business was making money but it wasn't making that much yeah I'm like well yeah. uh you know that's what it's gonna be so this guy now started finding anybody who else had something to do with cars and bring them in to say come take my place so it's like Man, everything is just literal competition. Everything and everywhere, mm -hmm. people, are either, if they don't generate theirs, they're coming to steal yours. Yeah. So you learn a lot in business of like, you have to hold your ground, maintain your chips, pre-plan. You know, you can't, almost you can't trust anybody mm -hmm. unless you've been dealing with them for a long time. Mm -hmm. So that became the downfall was to now relocate. I ended up, take, ended up taking all the cars and moving them down to another private building down in Boca, where they were supposed to pay me per per car, never got a dime from it. Mm -hmm. Sold all the lifts. So it was kind of like a heartbreak because I really loved that business. And but now you can Google auto storage and you see there's auto storage here, auto storage yeah. over here, auto storage in Delray, one in Boca. So it was helped spin up a nice concept. Yeah. But I made a lot of great clients from that. And I've taken all this knowledge and expertise out of it mm -hmm. to apply it to other areas. And now I've developed Corsi companies from, I've got a couple of friends, advisors say, you know what, start building your own name brand mm -hmm. and raise capital. So I, we raise capital. Now we're putting together a fund. We buy projects. I get basically every day a project comes in front of me. Like, Hey, Jeff, take a look at this. What do you think on that? Who can be involved? And then we PJP has become this incredible family slash conduit. Like mm -hmm. right now I'm looking for Dion Sanders. Last night, within an hour, I got, you know, within two degrees of now one of his buddies saying, hey, what's it about? Mm -hmm. And then I think in the next day or so, we're going to end up having a phone call with him. That's some pretty cool stuff. We've got some really great people in PJP and aviation because look how how special everybody is in aviation. You know, all these guys are serving people who are moving and they're serving the elite. The guys are making so, things. So PJP happen. is just like a network on Facebook. That's it's not it's not a it's not a company or anything. It's just a, a movement on on Facebook. It's a blend. It's kind of hybrid at the moment. We've yeah. got um so my CFO is Sandro Starna, Starna Financial Advisors. He's a remote CFO slash friend. Yeah. I've been with him for quite some time. Yeah. And when you start to surround yourself with other professionals mm -hmm. that have a name and a brand that people say, Oh yeah, I know that guy who, you know, he manages 19 other companies. Yeah. So when I drop his name with somebody else, they can back ground check him and say oh solid dude okay what are you guys into and any any thing that comes my way i say here here's this opportunity i look through it and i think it's decent i send it to them say what do you think they look through it and say yeah we want we want to get behind this mm -hmm. we just recently invested into a uh, a company you guys will see in the couple probably in the next coming months has yeah. to do with these things and i think these are kind of cumbersome still but it's going to get better it's where we want it to be is a long way to go 
but yeah. there's so many products where this is pretty cool to use. Like I have it on my desk. If yeah. I want to virtually check something out, I could throw this on and yeah. virtually check out whatever it is. It has to do with cars. I know you like cars. Yeah. Well, no, I'm 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 not that into cars. Uh, I'm, I'm planes, yes, but cars. I had a car business myself, selling classic cars. Uh, but my business partner ran away with all the money. So, <laughs> yeah. So that um, that didn't go down very well. But uh, yeah, we want to start a little car dealership, like a private stuff, because we buy we buy our own cars and then we end up selling them. So we figure we might as well sell our own cars. No, no. I had this guy in Italy who well, I used to live in Istanbul, half Italian, and uh, the the whole concept was let's um, let's buy Italian cars, uh, classic cars, and sell them on the international market. Um, because there's lots of people in Italy that suddenly, you know, they inherit a whole 20 Alfa Romeos. They don't know what to do with it. They want to sell it. And there's a lot of people around the world that like those kind of cars. Um, but the guy, you know, it was my mistake. I mean, I, I chose the wrong person to put in charge and I wasn't living there. So I, I couldn't pop in every every couple of days and see what was going on. Um, but, you know, you, as you said, you live and learn. So um, that's just the, 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 the way it is. I'm more these days into planes and, and real estate. That's That's more me. Okay. Yeah. Well, we're going to get some cars. We should definitely talk after this. And yeah. We can do a consultation. So tell me more about the um about the, the planes then. So you so you still fly, you've got your own planes now and you and you still do some contract flying. Yeah, Just I do a lot, of, fun, I do a lot right? of contract flying. Well, I guess let's touch on PJP because I mean, we're doing yeah. this at the briefing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, PJP started with uh, one of my clients. I was flying a Challenger 601 for. Yeah. And, and this guy. I was flying a client and the client really took a liking to me because he's got a kid yeah. and he invited me to dinner and it was just became a great friend. That's what's about relationships. Yeah. Uh, but the guy I was flying for called me up out of the blue and said, Hey Jeff, you're fired. I thought he was joking. Cause it was like that, you know, casual. <laughs> like, okay. Yeah. I'll see you tomorrow. Yeah. Then he called me back. He's like, no, 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 you're really fired. Like, okay. What did I do? Well, nothing. You've gone as far as you can go here. It's like, really? That's what he goes. Yep. I'm kicking you out of the nest. Uh -huh. okay so sometimes your clients kind of like feel like fatherly figures they'll yeah. they'll analyze you and realize okay you're a go-getter i can't keep my thumb on you much longer because you're going to want more <laughs> yeah. so they just they give you that proverbial kicking but he spent a bunch of money on me took me out to school we're in recurrent together and he's like look i know you think this is horrible but it's the best thing that's ever happened to you yeah. because you're you're not going to be flying gulf streams and helicopters and the stuff you really want to do here this is as yeah. far as i'm going so yeah. au revoir and I'm sending you out current so you can go make some contract money. So then this client called me and said, hey, uh, pick me up. I want to go from here to here. I was like, oh, sorry, man. I'm on the plane no more. What? What happened to it? It's like, yeah. I got fired. He's like, why would this guy fire you? Yeah. So I told him some of the story. He's like, man, okay, all right. He goes, well, get me a charter. So I got him a charter. Yeah. He invites me over to dinner. And we're, we're just chatting. He goes, well, we'll start your own business. I'm like, no, nah, I just want to fly, man. I'm like, I've, I've done some business stuff as a kid. And I love I love flying. That's what I want to do. He's like, well, just start your own business, man. Hmm. So he's like, well, what's it going to take to get you to start your own business? And I was like, well, I want to go to G4 school. That might that might convince me. He's like, how yeah. much does that cost? So it was like 25 grand. He yeah. reaches over, grabs a checkbook, writes me a check for 25 grand, just gives it to me. He's like, okay, go. The only caveat, you got to start your own business. Yeah. Okay. So I left that dinner meeting. I was like, this is funny. I was like, thank you. <laughs> right. Thank you. So I called up a friend of mine and, um, you know, these are where like people don't believe in God, but you got to look at the scenarios of like, how does the scenario just pop up like that? So if you put your faith and hope in that, that area, you, yeah. you can kind of go, you can answer some of that. Like you don't have to know everything. You just have to trust. Yeah. So I called up my friend and say, Hey, I got 25 grand. I want to go to G4 school. I know you have a couple of them on your, on the charter certificate. Do you think if I, can I jump in the mix with you guys? If, do you need any help? He's like, yeah, hang on a minute. Yeah. So I hung, hung on the phone for what something like eternity then he comes back and goes, all right, you're going to G5 school tomorrow morning. Be there. Okay. Like, Whoa, are you sure? I was like, that's 25 grand. He's like, yep. So uh, a dear friend of mine, Brian Campbell, um, who so I met took, out. So he took the 25 grand for G5 instead of G4. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. You know, sometimes you just take that leap of faith. Well, G5 is better I, rating. It leads you to the 550, yeah. I, yeah, but I, obviously, but I was kind of nervous because I was thinking, well, I want flight time. I don't want to just get a type rating. Yeah. Yeah. I want to get moved, but there was now there's an opportunity behind it. So I ended up meeting a bunch of good people out of that. I met Brian Campbell, and Brian Campbell was the rep at the time at CAE. Yeah. And he's the one that called me up afterwards and said, Merry Christmas. Yeah. We're giving you I'm Santa Claus this year. And Brian passed away. I don't know if you saw that on PJP this year. Yeah. It was like, you know, you see these people that are involved in your life that help 
put their fingerprints on you the, to send you on your path. Mm. Well, I end up calling us. So I had to go with this guy. This it would take us a long time to unpack all this. Anyway, yeah. I'll short shorthand it. Yeah. Go out to G5 school. I get a phone call from my flight attendant at the time. And she says, Hey, I hear you're in G5 school. I'm like, How'd you hear this? So I had rubbed it in my co pilot's nose. I'm like, I'm in G5 yeah. school, bro. Yeah. So she goes, Hang on a minute. Puts me on the phone with a guy. And he's like, Hey, uh, I need you to go to 550 differences. I need you on our 550. So I, I went to the differences, went out, and I ended up with six months of straight contract work. Oh, nice. Right, right out of the gate. It was pretty cool. Yeah. And then I had to build this company. His This guy's wife says, hey, uh, I like the name Luxaris. And I was like, it's kind of a tough one. There's already a Luxair over in Europe. And okay, yeah. if that's what you guys want. So we started Luxaris. I'm thinking, well, what can I offer differently than everybody's not offering? So I thought, you know what's great? If I'm going to be a full-time contract pilot, I get a lot of my flying gigs from aircraft sales. So yeah. a broker, and this is, if you're a contract pilot and you're listening, this is some of the gold. You yeah. got to know where the source is is it's like you got to go where the money is you got to go where the traffic is you know you want to be the real estate and the best piece of property so brokers are always buying and selling airplanes they want somebody to be on their team and i would call brokers and say hey listen you got a uh, lear 60 for sale or whatever you know you got a this for sale i happen to be this pilot but listen i'm not just any pilot i know you want to sell that airplane so when your clients come on board that's the best airplane in the world right yeah. Oh yeah. And they finally get it like, Oh, this guy gets it. You know, I got to make this deal. And not that I want to help pedal junk, but yeah. when the airplane's a nice airplane, the thing of the deal goes through versus, Oh, this because the owner always, the new buyer always comes up and says, Hey, you're flying this thing. You know, what's your thoughts? You know, how, yeah. how's it work? Yeah. I flew, I flew one beach jet one time and this thing was like, like yeah. this flying, I was you know sitting there with the rudders to keep it for the yard. And for any beach jet pilot, go, oh, yeah, I know what those things are like. And the guy buys the airplane on the spot. Yeah, And then this, this guy says to the next guy, hey, use this guy. He was a great pilot. Really helped me out with this deal. Yeah. So that's that's the game we play. Yeah. So Luxaris, I decided, well, if you're going to buy a plane, might as well find a pilot that's typed in it that's near that airplane. So I was trying to geographically position airplanes for sale in the, a current pilot. So I put this nice site together. And I'm like, well, now where do I find these pilots? So I'm Googling and I fall across findapilot.com and I pick one pilot and put them on there and I call a couple of buddies and say, you mind if I put you on there? Yeah, that's fine. So I put them on there and I send an email now to all of them saying, hey, you're here. Well, John Peroria from Find a Pilot called me up. He's like, Jeff, I love the site. I'm like, oh, thanks, man. I love the profile. Super cool. I wish you all the best in business. Just do me a favor. I'm like, yeah, what's that? Anything. Just don't scrape my website. I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, I own Find a Pilot. I was like, oh my God, dude, the first guy that I found. I was like, you gotta be kidding me. Okay. I was embarrassed and I was like, man, this is gonna be hard. So like, okay, no problem. God is my witness. I won't not scrap your I won't scrape your website or anybody else's site mm-hmm. for that matter. So no problem. And now I'm like thinking, man, back to the drawing board. What do I do? But meanwhile, I'm busy. I'm flying like crazy, flying the G5, the 550, mm-hmm. the other stuff, the challenger. So I'm like rotating. And I always kept myself current in two or three airplanes because mm-hmm. it was like feast or famine. But if you can figure out a way to get over the famine and the famine was, you're not always getting a phone call for G550. You're yeah. going, hey, we need the 601 move. Hey, we needed this move. We need a Lear 55 move. We need a Lear 35 flow. So you're kind of becoming, you know, flexible, malleable to fit into all these areas. Yeah. And, you know, I was keeping the momentum going and that's really key to becoming successful is finding the momentum mm-hmm. and w- let, watching things develop. You want everything like now, but you have to be that patient farmer and watch it grow. So I, I got so busy with all these contracts. Now I realize like, well, I need a twin because I'm maxed out and I can't fly 30 days a month. I'm also getting tired. Yeah, of course. The travel here, airline there, fun. And then I'm trying to manage the accounting. Sometimes I forget, like people call me like, hey, are you going to bill me for that trip? Jeez. <laughs> now I'm working for free. Yeah. So I'm, I'm now, hey, Phil. Can you cover me? Hey, John, can you cover me? Hey, Tiffany, can you fly this? Hey, that was like half of my day now was to try to fill in some of my gaps. And I'm like, this is terrible. Yeah. This, how is there nothing that's that's helping me with this thing? Yeah. So in texting, so I'm, I just happened to be on Facebook and we were using airmail at the time. It was pretty busy. Mm-hmm. Um, but airmail, you couldn't have any pictures. Every time I load a picture, send you an error message. I'm like, this is dumb. Why can't they let you send pictures there? So I was on Facebook and Facebook just popped up a message. Start a group. I'm like, mm-hmm. oh, okay. Typed in private jet pilot. It says available. Created it. I added 10 of my buddies that I was always calling all the time. Said, hey, I'm going to use this thing now when the trip pops up. I'll just mm-hmm. post it in here. I didn't think anything of this at all. Yeah. 
all of a sudden it just started going, Hey, can I add Tom? Hey, can I add Greg? Can I have so-and-so? So -and, -so? and they would be sending me their resumes and I'd be filling up my filing cabinet with resumes over here going, all right, he's a solid dude. Okay. This is a legit guy. Yeah. Not even thinking like, Hey, you're building a Rolodex of, of pros out here. Yeah. And all these guys were vetted by the previous guy. Mm -hmm. So it's like, well, if I knew I needed a guy, because when you're doing contract flying, you need a mission pilot. You need somebody that's going to take the airplane from here to here, make you look good and do a good job. Obviously, if the airplane's not airworthy and it's got broken stuff, we're not pushing anybody to do anything like that. But there's a lot of babies out there that they want to ground an airplane for a light bulb. They don't have they don't know the right things to say. They'll talk themselves out of a job before they even get the job. I've listened to guys on the phone that I'm saying, hey, I've got this trip. It's going to go from Boca to Teterboro. And then the next day from Teterboro to Dallas. Mm -hmm. It's on a Challenger 604, and they're starting to ask me the dumbest questions. And at first, I would play along, but then I realized, like, this guy's wasting my time. Like, do you want to fly the plane, or you just want to talk about stuff that has nothing to do with flying? And yeah. they're trying to fill their minds with – I'm like, you're filling your mind with useless data. Dude, you show up. You get paid. If the airplane's broken when you show up, you just tell them, your, your airplane's broken here. So what would you like me to do? But I'm here. Yeah. So I was like, why do I have to? Why do I have to train grown people? This stuff. This is kind of obvious. You want to make money. pilots all over the world, or just in the U.S.? Uh, I started with just U.S., but now we're all over the world. Yeah. yeah. And we've got the, like our office is up in New York, so it's we don't advertise. It's kind of underground. I mean, we do have a new privatejetpilots.com website that's about to be relaunched. We finally found a company that we like. Every time we I, I made up with somebody who's gonna like, we understand the business model because it's pretty big. Yeah. They put together something and it's junk. And you, you've, you've taken six months to a year to develop it. Now I've got new development strategies. And out of all this, obviously, I've learned website development and design and people and networks. And there's always something coming out of it. Yeah. So PJP just started growing up. It's now, I don't know, 18,000 people. But unfortunately, Facebook, we lost all the, the controls. Like in the beginning, we knew everybody. And you can keep people from going out. Now the roster, I think it's... Let me show you this. It's probably something like a thousand people waiting to get in. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Member request. 1,399 people to get approved. Wow. You can't keep up with it. And if you leave it like this, Facebook starts letting people in. I'm like, why'd they let that person in? It's almost like they want your groups to grow to keep their yeah. traffic flowing. Yeah. And of course, because of, you know, because of what happened with lockdowns and that more people are flying by private jet now. So the market's picked up even more. So, yeah. Makes, There's uh, always, always a lot to learn, always a lot to share. So you've got your own air, you have your own airplanes now though, don't you? You have a couple yeah. of planes. So yeah. What, what, what planes do you own? We've got a uh, TBM 700 and got a TTX, got an R44. Nice. How's the TBM 700? Pretty good. It's okay. It's slow. No, yeah, of course. <laughs> Compared to a jet, yeah, it's slow. Yeah. yeah, I really want to. I'd like the Cirrus Vision jet. I like. I just think I've flown. I've flown it. A lot of pilots look at that thing like it looks like a goldfish or something. A guppy. It is, but it's once you fly it, it's like this coolest thing because they really gave you that car feeling. Like you know how you like to drive a Porsche and you're like, this yeah. is a nice. Car. It's yeah. got that feel to it. You sit in this thing, you're like, this is a plane. This is so cool. No, it's, so clever, it's clever what they've done. Uh, what Cirrus have done with the parachute and everything in that. Um, I mean, I. I just had a client buy Cirrus, the, the prop version. And so I had to organize the ferry from Italy all the way over to, to Houston. And so I, I get, I meet this Cirrus pilot um, and gave him the, the, the job to, to fly the airplane. And he's ferried 19 Cirrus, no, 20 Cirrus this year across the Atlantic. Wow. Either from, from Europe to America, from America to Europe. Uh, crazy. He said, these things are selling like hotcakes. And a lot of these people now that that sold, in fact, the guy initially that sold the Cirrus has bought a Cirrus jet, which we're ferrying over to him on the 27th now to uh, to Italy uh, from Utah, believe it or not. So, uh, yeah, so the Cirrus are really, you know, they're, they're, they're getting them, they're, they're foot in the market now. It's interesting. Um, I, I like the parachute. Why would you not want a little extra backup safety? I'm not sure. I haven't been to the training yet on it for the vision jet because i know they're all like caps 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 yeah yeah i think but i think you end up with uh you know attorneys end up dictating a lot of issues with that kind of stuff so it's like this is just yeah the the, there the was box. a cra there was a crash in florida a few was it a month or something ago a guy was flying from uh miami up to kissimmee 
and he ended up in a thunderstorm, freaked out, pulled the chute, um, and the vision jet landed in a swamp. And all the people got out, no one got injured, but they were lucky they didn't end up in a swamp with crocodiles. Um, and I and I thought to myself, this guy didn't check the weather. You know what the weather's like in Florida. You live in Florida. If there's a storm, it will last maybe a couple of hours and then it goes away. So if you're sitting on the ground in Miami, you see that the weather's st- don't. I think these people think, well, it's got a parachute. If anything goes wrong, I'll just pull the chute. Uh, no, you should be, you know, analyzing the weather weather a bit more. But you know, sometimes these pilot owners they just think because they own the jet that they they own the the weather. As I said to a passenger of mine many years ago, when we almost crashed an airplane because he pushed us out into this valley in the, in the Swiss Alps. And we took off in the middle of a thunderstorm and the plane was going all over the place. And anyway, eventually we got up at altitude and everybody had been screaming and scared in the back. And, and, and he came up the front and he said, Oh, I'm sorry. I said, look, um, we actually ended up taking off uh, overweight because it was a rush, rush, rush to get in the air before the storm hit, hit the, um, the airfield. And I said, this is the first and last time this ever happens. I said, you have a lot of money, of course, because as you wouldn't be able to charter this airplane. But, you know, God controls the weather and you can't buy him. <laughs> so, you know, uh, and he, you know, he was he humbled himself uh, and it taught me a lesson. And in fact, about a month later, I had a similar situation happen to me again. But this time I turned around to the passenger and said, no, we're not going. <laughs> it's happened to me once, not happened to me again. I survived the first one. And that was a warning. So, you know, weather is the weather and you've got to be careful because, you know, it can't kill you. So um, I think about the situations like in that Cirrus, you've got the Garmin 5000 package with XM weather. Yeah. So even if he didn't check the weather, he could have checked the weather in route and be like, you know what? Let me go the other way. Or let me do something else. I think every pilot should read Fate as the Hunter. You yeah, but, you know, I mean, I spent 13 years flying for the airlines. This is 737, worked my way up to 737 captain. And, uh, you know, one of the airlines I worked for, you get into the briefing room in the morning and there's like 50 737s leaving and there's 50 briefing stations. Uh, I was working for Ryanair at the time down in London. And you're there, you meet up with the crew. Some of the times you've never seen them before because there's lots of crews based at the same place. Um, and, you you know, you go through the SOPs, you go through your notes, you go through your weather. You decide on the fuel, uh, you brief everybody and off you go. Um, but, you know, weather is one of the things you look at. And, and But, you know, a lot of these owner pilots, they just think they can jump in and go. Um, and, you know, it, it, it can get dangerous if you don't plan. And planning is really, really key. Um, I was, you know, I always quote the five Ps. Planning uh, it prevents poor performance. So prior planning prevents poor performance, the five Ps. So the prior planning is key, whether you're shooting a golf ball or, or you're flying a plane, uh, you got to, you know, pre-plan uh, to ensure that you you get performance and not poor performance. And, and I think that's really, really, really key. So, Jeff. Breaking the chain. Yeah. Yes. Or the, or the famous error chain. Yeah. That yeah that's seven. why I push. That's why I push phase the hunter. It's not my book, but it's just it helped me in so much, because if you look at it as like life is your chain is if you just take that link out and replace it with a different scenario, that one little tiny, tiny thing could have been all it took to yeah. push this different path. Yeah. The Swiss cheese model. Yeah. You call it chain or I call it the Swiss cheese model. Yeah. And I've heard like the Swiss cheese model. How's that go? Well, basically if, if all, if, if you've got seven slices of Swiss cheese, which have got holes in them and the pen fits all the way through. So what they've discovered is accidents don't happen for one reason. It's usually six or seven reasons. Uh, So, you know, you turn up in the morning and you're tired. You had a bad night's sleep, for example. So you're a bit tired. Um, So that's like element number one on the chain. You get to, you see the weather's bad. That's number two. Then there's a, there's a tech problem with the airplane, but it's it's not a no-go item. So you can still fly. There's number three. So you haven't even taken off yet. And you've got three links on the error chain um, before you even get into the air. And it, and when number seven hits, that's when the accident happens. So they've looked at all the all the accidents and they come up with this Swiss cheese model. So when you recognize the chain being formed or, or, the, or the bits of Swiss cheese lining up, um, you need to do something to interrupt it um, in order to you know stop. So, for example, if you're really, really tired and you're not up for it, don't go flying. That would be one way of doing it. Or you get to the airplane and there's a tech problem and the engineer says to you, OK, you can go. You say, no, I prefer you to fix it before I go. Um, you know, there, there's things that you can do to sort of manage that from to, in order to stop it from building up and causing an accident. 
Um, so that's, that's, they call it the Swiss cheese model. Um, and I found that very useful for me a number of times, you know, in managing myself and the crew is, you know, let, let's talk, let's analyze the situation. Let's, I can kind of envision what you said about the cheese. You're going through the holes. And as long as you rotate the slice, there's no hole to go through next. Like I right, rotated the slice of cheese. I like how you guys think of things in terms of food over there. Oh yeah. Well, you know, food in Europe is, is important. <laughs> we're, we're not like, let's just eat a quick ham hamburger and go. It's, uh, but, but I mean, I spent 20 years in Italy and, you know, in Italy, food is really important. You sit at the table for like two hours and you have three courses meal. Uh, I remember I, I used to fly citations from Milan and we would, in the morning, if you were going to Rome, you knew there was another four or five airplanes going to Rome at the same time. So you'd all launch out at the same time and you'd land and all the people you were flying were, were going to the same meeting. So you'd all go to the restaurant together. So there's a table of 10 pilots <laughs> having their pizza um, for lunch. While, while the various bosses went to their meetings and then you'd meet up afterwards and, and fly back home and then it'd be a race who gets back to Milan first. <laughs> so I got a, a flying question. Yes. Milan, Cirrus yeah. SR22, you're a private pilot or instrument pilot, whatever you are. You just want to fly your own personal airplane. You want to go from Milan to Rome. Yeah. Is it What's it like over there? Is it anything like the States? Like here, if I want to go from my house to Teterboro, I just hop in and go. Well, it's not, it's, let's put it this way. It's, in Europe, it's not as easy to fly like it is in America because it, it's smaller. And, and also you've got the problem of the languages. Now, it's true that the international language is English, but you try and fly into Paris Charles de Gaulle, which I'm sure you've, you've been into France, and you hear all the Air France pilots speaking French. Um, and so you're sitting there and they're talking French and, and when they should be speaking English so that everybody can understand. Um, so you've got, the language um, and the airspace, there's not so much room. You, you have to file a flight plan every time you go. Um, you, you wouldn't sort of launch out VFR. And, th and then you've got the mountains and everything, depending on where you are. But for example, here in England, we've got bad weather, a lot of bad weather. So it's difficult to do a lot of flying in the winter in particular. Um, if you're flying in Italy and you're going to the north, you've got the mountains, the Swiss Alps. So you, you've got to watch that. But even if you're going down from Milan to Rome, there are a few mountains and everything in that. So, you know, you're going through different types of airspace um, and, you know, it, it does require planning. Um, but, you know, aviation isn't as, well, general aviation isn't as common and, and easy to, to, to fly around as it is in the U.S. I mean, as you said. In the, how, how do you guys account for plan, like budget planning for like Euro control fees? Like if I go fly from here to Teterboro, I'm not going to get some sort of ATC fee in the mail later. I might get a landing fee in Teterboro, but I can kind of think that it might be a hundred bucks. How do well, you no, guys... no, you've, you've got to calculate it you've got to calculate it how much and what you were doing i mean one one company i worked for uh fly 737s we used to fly manchester down to tenerife which is in the canary islands and the director of flight operations discovered there was an airway which was cheaper to fly down it was an extra 15 minutes flying but when you worked out the numbers it was cheaper to, to do extra 15 minutes of flying than go down another air route um and so we would go a few miles offshore almost transatlantic kind of so off the Atlantic, all the way down, down this Tango something or other it was called, down this airway, because it was cheaper. Um, but, you know, you just got to calculate everything and, and, and find out. But, you know, it is expensive flying in Europe. Uh, fuel is more expensive. Landing fees are more expensive. And then you've got the Euro control as well. Um, and when you land, you've got to pay handling as well. So it's not like in the US where you land, you just pay for your fuel and off you go. Uh, here you land, you've got landing fee. You've got handling fee. You've got fuel. <laughs> and a few other things thrown on top and then they, they they may tax your passengers as well so you'll pay so much per passenger um so you know it can be very very expensive which is why private jet usage isn't as common as it is in the us and and people people that fly for a hobby it's not as common as it is in um in the us i mean for example in italy to become a member of an what they call an aero club you have to pay an annual fee which is like two thousand dollars and you haven't done any flying yet so you pay two thousand a year to become a member of the club, and then on top of that, you pay for your flying. So it's it's quite expensive, which is why a lot of guys they just head to the US and do their their hours in the US, and then they go over and take their exams in Europe. And, and that. there's no organization advocating for that over there to try to alleviate some of that for the small stuff. Not really, not really. I mean, for example, the situation in Italy is because Mussolini, who was a dictator during the Second World War, was a very he loved aviation. He loved airplanes. In fact, the Italian aviation industry was booming under Mussolini. But when he got killed and, and Italy came out of the Second World War, anything aviation was seen as fascist. 
So the whole aviation industry was almost shut down. I mean, there's a few companies that managed to survive and do a few things, um, but it's, it's always seen as a fascist thing. Um, and so they kind of, and then, you know, the, the problem is all the different countries and different languages and everything. It's just a bit more difficult. And now Europe has gone completely socialist. Um, and so that doesn't really help people buy an airplane and, and, and fly their own airplane. So th th there's all these sort of things that have, have cropped in. So I, I find that the US, especially for recreational flying, is the best place. Because as you said, you can just jump in and go. Um, and I remember when I was in LA, I was doing my hour building my commercial pilot's license. I did in, in LA, I was up in Van Nuys. And, you know, I'd meet people with their own Cessna and they would just fly for business because it was, you know, fun, cheaper. They, they beat all the, all the, uh, the, the traffic on the freeway because they would just fly over it <laughs> and get to their destination in 30 minutes instead of four hours by car. Um, but it's, it's so more, you know, lenient in that and easier to, to fly in the U S than it is in, in, in Europe. Um, that's just the way it is, unfortunately. I mean, regu regulation over regulation and over regulation, it just slows things down. Um, and as it slows things I down- I feel it's like it's a mindset down. though too, because I told Jordan FaceTime me real quick to see if I can just call him out on it. Cause we say the number one saying that they say there in Europe is it's not possible, not possible. And it's like, well, they're all programmed that way. Like, why is it not possible? They don't even know. It's like, it's like minion mentality. They've been told from some organization or something, you just- can it's like you know you fly someplace and they say oh you you can't leave the airplane here you need to repo an hour over there and it's like as a pilot that annoys me because in my mind the whole entire time i'm going over i'm already planning out oh, i'm gonna go see this place i'm gonna go see that place and i want to go eat here yeah. and i want to go yeah. do that and i want to go see this person yeah. Yeah. and then they're like oh you got to fly an hour away and it's like flying an hour away is obviously a four-hour car ride back yeah, yeah, exactly. Like exactly. That. So it's like, well, you just basically tossed my whole plans down the window oh, for what? Because you say it's not possible. And, I'm and also, around. the other thing, Jeff, is that people don't understand here in Europe is that the private jet in particular is a business tool. No, they think it's something that just rich people use. And oh, and rich people, like that young girl in Sweden that's against airplanes and everything and that, you, know, you how dare you fly by private jet? And then I discovered she flew into the States on a private jet. But anyway, that's another story for another day. But but the thing is, the private jet is seen as a thing that rich people do. So they don't want to fly with the minions on the on the airline. So they they buy this really expensive private jet, which costs them $20,000 an hour. And off they go instead of flying EasyJet or Ryanair. Um, that's the way people see the private jet. But they don't realize that the private jet is a business tool if it's used in a certain way. Um, I mean, here, for example, if you if you want to buy an airplane and you want to charter it out when you're not using it, if it's if it's older than five years old, people won't want to fly on it because all the brokers have gone out and told everybody you have to have an airplane that's younger than five years old. Well, who told you that? I mean, what's wrong with a 10 year old airplane or 20 year old, old airplane? If it's in good condition, the interior has been looked after. All the maintenance has been done. It's maybe got a new paint job and everything. What's wrong with a 20 year old airplane? But here in Europe, 20 year old airplane, oh, it's trash. They don't, they don't consider it, you know, uh, it's just a, it's, a, it's a mindset thing. And unfortunately, it, the economy in Europe has been flat for the last 25 years. It hasn't grown, it hasn't got, well, it's probably gone down a bit now. But, you know, and I think, you know, the private jet is a business tool. And if you use it in the right way, it can make you a ton of money. I mean, Grant Cardone, who you've probably seen, Grant says that all the time. He's, he's telling me all the time, you know, my jet is the best business investment I've ever made was my private jet. Because with that jet, I do so many more deals that I couldn't do if I was flying with the airlines. Walmart was built because of private aviation. Sam Walton used to fly his own airplane, and then he built a whole fleet. And they've got almost 30 airplanes that they fly, and they're all their executives. So, And I always say to people, you want cheap groceries in Walmart? Well, you have to thank private jets for that. Because if they didn't have private jets, they wouldn't. the business wouldn't run the way it is. Um, but you try and tell someone that's here in Europe, oh, no, no, no. It's like an evil thing. <laughs> It's one of that's, those they, that's because you need more GA. If the GA was freer and easier, then more people would experience it. Like I get a lot of people like, all right, let's say helicopter flying over here. Um, when you fly the helicopter and you land someplace, people think you're instantly, they think you're crashing. Yeah. And it's, I've had people come drive up a car and like park it right at me, like to try to block me from getting out. You know, you're in the process of shutting down the blades got a spool. So they got time to run over. So they park, come out and go, who do you think you are? What do you think you're doing? Like, they're just nosy. Like, can, yeah. can I help you? Yeah. You know, what are you doing? And my kids would be getting out with backpacks. Like I dropped, I used to drop them off at school. Yeah. 
And like, are you stealing these kids? I'm like, really? You just like, what's wrong with your mind? I'm like, they're getting out and walking to the school over there. I'm like, this is, well, you know, it just, they couldn't wrap their mind around that people are doing something other than what they're doing, clicking a remote, watching TV. And then I said, okay, hang on. You know, I'm glad you have to come on over, get in. Yeah. Now, Drop obviously, the kid off at school in the helicopter. That's I take cool. them for a little ride, and they're like, "Oh, wow! It's, you know, like, okay, this is amazing." It's like, "Yeah, now I'll drop you back off at your house." You know, you park yeah. right there. It's yeah. like people's minds. It's kind of like you have to come and see. And if the if it was a great way to tell people come and see, they get the experience and realize, you know, you're you're putting a cap on something that you don't understand. You're, you're well, something- it'd be interesting when the EV tolls hit the market, and people start flying those things around. Um, I think the biggest hurdle they're going to have is, well, certification, first of all, but also being able to fly in certain areas. Here in Europe, it's going to be difficult for them to authorize these things to be flying in the cities and whatever. I think U.S. won't have a problem. Um, And I think it's going to be a great benefit for countries like Indonesia, Philippines, which are loads of islands. To get his, getting stuff from island to island with these EV tolls is going to be absolutely fantastic. It's going to make that economy go through the roof. Um, but I think regulation is, is going to be, and it's particularly here in Europe, it's, everything is overregulated, and that's the, the big problem. And something like aviation, which does require a certain degree of, of, of um, regulation, it's, it's, there's too, too much regulation, and it just slows business down, unfortunately. We need, we need some politicians that aren't politicians over here. <laughs> Real well, people. We're, we're working on taking pjp and turning into an association there's attorneys already working on that and doing the research and putting the corporate structure together and we're looking for things to get behind as an association as a voice you know with pilots to be able to speak and I got into flying because i love airplanes and flying yeah and i think 75 percent of them that's probably my my number i think 75 percent of them got into it because they love flying yeah same here i started flying think, when i was a money. kid well, that guy's thinking money yeah I was I was 15 when I started flying gliders and then got my license at 17 and off I went. Um, so, yeah, same like you. I mean, I started flying because I like flying. Um, and, you know, but, you know, the plane is 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 a, it takes people and cargo from A to B. It's also fun to do. Um, and I mean, the pilot owners now are increasing big time, uh, which is which is good. Uh, as long as they, they train them, get trained properly. I think that that's, there's going to be a big market there for those people. But anyway, Jeff, thank you very much for being on BizJet TV and talking to us about the PJP story and success. Um, and we hope we can, you know, you can grow this over time and, and help people to sort of open their minds to the private jets and aviation in general, because we need more people flying. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's great to meet you. Congratulations for making it to the end of this episode of BizJet TV. As I promised you in the beginning, Great conversation with Jeff Kersey, a great guy, lots of insights. So let's get the comments going below. Let me know what you thought of the interview. Uh, would you like more interviews like this? Let's get the conversation going. If you haven't subscribed to BizJet TV, I encourage you to subscribe to the channel. And you can also gain access to exclusive content by clicking on the join button below. And you'll find out how to do that. And also give us a super thanks uh, uh, by clicking on the thanks button below. Now, uh, if you enjoyed this interview, you're going to enjoy the next video, which you can click on right here. It's a story of George Tucano, who moved from Moldova to America just 12 years ago. Uh, started working as a handyman and worked his way up in 12 years to build an empire uh, with 200 trucks, uh, uh, delivering cargo all over America. And he's learned to fly and bought his own Fina 100 jet, which he flies himself. So it's a great, great story that this young man managed to do this in 12 years. So click on that video and enjoy that one too. And that's all from Fabrizio Foley on BizJet TV, and I'll see you on the next one.